In this video, we're going to talk about the French, the French Revolution. And what makes this especially significant is that not only is this independence from a monarchy-controlled empire, like in the American independence, this is an actual overthrowing of a monarchy, of a monarchy that controls a major world power. So this is on some levels, uh, you know, depending on how you view it, the American Revolution came first and kind of uh, uh, put out the principles of self-governance and you know why do we need kings and all of that. But the French Revolution was the first time it, those type of principles really took foot in Europe and really overthrew a monarchy. So just to understand kind of the environment in which this began, let's talk about what France was like. In 17, in 1789, which most people kind of view as the beginning of the revolution. One, France was poor. France was poor. Now, you wouldn't think that France was poor if you looked at Louis the Sixteenth, who was king of France. If you looked at Louis the Sixteenth and the clothes he wore. If you looked at Marie Antoinette, his wife, Antoinette. They don't look poor. They lived in the Palace of Versailles, which is which was you know it was ginormous. It's this massive palace. It would it would compare to uh, the greatest palaces in the world. They were living a lavish lifestyle. And if, in case you want to know where this is, this is what's now almost a suburb of Paris, but at the time it was a village, uh, 20 or 30 uh, kilometers away from Paris. So they 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 don't seem to be poor, but the the actual government of France. Is poor, and when I say poor, they've they're in debt. They've just had two major military adventures. One was the American Revolution. American Revolution. They played a major part in supporting the revolutionaries because they wanted to stick it to their enemy, Great Britain. They wanted their empire to be uh, uh, to, to shrink a little bit. So France sent significant military and uh, military help and resources. And you can imagine that's not a cheap thing when you're doing it uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. And even before the American Revolution, the Seven Years' War, the Seven Years' War that ended in 1763, this really drained the amount of wealth that the French government had. And for those of y'all who are uh, more American history focused, the Seven Years' War is really the same thing as the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War was the North American theater of the Seven Years' War, but the Seven Years' War is a more general term because there was also a, a, a conflict going on in Europe simultaneously. The, the, the French and Indian was just part of that conflict, and the Seven Years actually engulfed most of the powers of Europe at the time. So France had participated in this, ended in 1763, you had the American Revolution. Both of these really just drained the amount of funds that the government itself had. At the same time, the French people were starving. So people, people starving. There was a generalized famine at the time. They weren't producing enough grain. People couldn't get their bread to eat. So you can imagine when people are starving, they're not happy. And to make kind of add insult to injury, you would see your royals living like this. But even worse than the royals, who you don't see every day, you saw your nobility, who is roughly a little over, you know, they're about one one and a half percent of the population. But you saw the nobility really, really living it up. So nobility, nobility, living it up. Living it up. And the nobility, just so you know, these are people with fancy titles who inherit land and wealth from generation to generation. They don't dress too differently from the king, and they essentially live in smaller versions of the Palace of Versailles. And you work, if you're a peasant, you work on their fields, do all the work, you send them some of your crops, and they pay no taxes. So, you know, from your point of view, and it's not hard to understand why you would think this, these are essentially, you know, kind of parasites who are completely uh, ignoring the, the fact that you're starving. And you're paying all of the taxes. You can imagine people weren't too happy about that. And then to top it all off, you had all of these philosophers hanging around, you know, talking about the Enlightenment. 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 And this is kind of the whole movement where people and authors and 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 poets are starting to realize that and philosophers are starting to realize that, gee, you know, maybe maybe we don't need kings. Maybe we don't need priests to tell us uh, what it means to be good or bad. Maybe people could uh, essentially uh, could rule themselves all of a sudden. And obviously the the biggest proof of the Enlightenment was the American Revolution. 
That was kind of the first example of people rising up and saying, you know, gee, we don't need these kings anymore. We want to govern ourselves, you know, for the people, by the people. So you also had kind of this philosophical movement going around. Now, if you ask me my opinion of what the biggest thing, I think the people starving. You can never underestimate what people are willing to do when they're actually going. When they're actually hungry, and you know, this is kind of more from the intellectual point of view. People said, "Oh, there's this Enlightenment movement here." So this is the state of France. They had a financial crisis, so a a meeting was called, kind of an emergency meeting of the major groups of France to try to resolve to try to resolve some of these problems. France is in, it's a fiscal crisis. People are starving. What do you do? So they called the convocation of the Estates General. Let me write that down. Con vocation of the estates general which was a meeting of the three estates of France now that sounds like a very you know what are the three estates of France you can really just view them as the three major social classes of France the first estate the first estate was the clergy the second estate is, let me just write two there the second estate is the nobility. And then the third estate is everyone else. Is everyone else. Let me do that in a different color. Everyone else. And this gives you a sense of how skewed the power structure, because people kind of grouped the power as, OK, these are the three groups, and maybe they can vote against each other. But this was only 0.5% of the population. This is 1.5% of the population. This was 98% of the population. 98% of the population, but these people had equal weight with these guys, and the, but these people had the burden of most of the taxes. These are people who are doing all of the work, producing all of France's wealth, dying in the wars, but these guys, despite their small population, have more weight than everybody else. So you had the convocation of the states generals, where representatives of these three estates met at the palace of Versailles to essentially figure out what to do about this fiscal crisis. Now, obviously, these people right here, the third estate, they were angry. They're like, look, we, we've, we've taken the burden on ourselves for much of the history, recent history of France. We're tired of you guys getting away with not paying taxes and just you know, kind of leeching off of us. They, didn't, they were afraid that there, even more of the tax burden is going to be put on them, and nothing is, and the nobility, or the king, or the clergy, that they wouldn't have to make sacrifices. So they came in already angry. And so they really wanted to meet in one big room together, because they actually had roughly 600 representatives, which only the king at the last minute agreed to. Before, it was only going to be equal numbers of them. These guys had 300, roughly. These guys had 300 as well. These guys were able to say, hey, we're 98% of the population. Maybe we should have at least 600 representatives. But even there, they wanted to meet in the same room and essentially try to make it so it's you know, one representative, one vote. But obviously, these these other estates, the clergy and the nobility, say, no, 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 let's each vote as estates and all of that. But at the end of the day, these guys lost. So they were essentially forced to uh, kind of uh, organize independently as a third estate. So that made them even angrier. So they met in an assembly hall and they said, you know what? If these guys are going to ignore us, not only are we going to uh, be in this room and, and start organizing ourselves, but we're not going to call this the convocation of the Estates General. We're going to declare that we are the National Assembly of France. The National Assembly of France. That we represent the people. We are essentially become, going to become the parliamentary body of France, instead of just being this emergency uh, convocation of the Estates General. And they actually got some sympathy from some elements of the clergy and some elements of the nobility. Now, obviously, Louis the Sixteenth was, you know, he was not amused by this whole turn of events. Here he was. He was an absolute monarch, which means that he held pretty much all of the power to do as as he saw whatever he saw was fit and all of a sudden you had this group of upstarts you know they're taking advantage of this emergency situation where he can't you know continue to buy as as many silk robes as he was before they're taking advantage of this situation to declare a national assembly of France to, to, to declare somehow that I'm not an absolute monarch that my power is going to be taken by this assembly so he wasn't happy so when they took a break he locked the door of the assembly room so they couldn't get in. And he said, oh, you know, I think there, there, there needs to be some repairs in that room. Uh, maybe you all can assemble later. And that was kind of his way of saying, no, you know, I, I'm not going to, if you're declaring you're, you're a National Assembly of France, I'm not even going to let you assemble. I'm not even going to let you get in the room. So that clearly did, didn't do a lot to make 
these guys, or in particular, these guys, any happier. People are hungry. These people are living lavishly. They've already been not allowed to vote in one room together. When they vote in their own room and declare themselves as representative of the people of France, which they really are, the king locks the room, doesn't let them go in, so they go to an indoor tennis court in Versailles. This is a picture of it right here. This is an indoor tennis court. Tennis court. And it's in Versailles, and that gives you an idea of how lavish Versailles was, that it had indoor tennis court in the, at, in, in, in the late 1700s. And they proclaimed the tennis court oath. Tennis court oath. Where they proclaimed, not are we only the National Assembly of France, but even more than that, we all pledge to not stop until we create a constitution of France. A constitution of France. So they went from being a national assembly to essentially morphing into a constituent assembly. We were going to create a constitution. Consti Let me write that a little bit neater. Constitution for France. For France. And they had sympathy from some elements of the clergy and the nobility. So eventually Louis the Sixteenth, you know, he kinda saw the writing on the wall. He didn't like the you know, people are angry. And, you know, every time he tries to mess with them, they only get angrier and they only go to even more extreme measures. So he, you know, just to kind of make them make it seem like he's going along, he's like, okay, that's cool guys, you know, oh whatever y'all want to do. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm open to it. We are in an emergency and maybe it is unreasonable. I have been a little bit unreasonable. So he lets them be, he lets them assemble again. But while that's happening, while that's happening, people start to notice that troops are converging on Paris. Troops, let me write that down. Troops converging, converging, converging on Paris. And they're obviously being sent there by the king. And not only are they just any troops, a lot of the actual troops, even though they are, they are French troops, they're under the authority of France's military, they were actually foreign foreign troops. So if you think about it, these would be the ideal types of troops to put down any type of insurgency or any type of rebellion, or even better, to go in and dissolve the National Assembly. So people started getting a little bit paranoid, you could imagine. Now on top of that, Louis XVI's main financial advisor, Necker, Jacques Necker, he Told Louis, and he was sympathetic to the third estate, to the plight of the third estate, right, capital. He was sympathetic to their plight, and he said, "Hey, you know, Mr. King, why don't you, uh, you know, I think it's reasonable for you to essentially budget your expenses a little bit better, maybe a little bit less of a lavish lifestyle, considering the state of our 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 the government's budget than the the state of the people of France. They're in this, you know, they're they're starving. Uh, why don't you do that a little bit?" But Louis the Sixteenth, instead of taking his advice, he fired him. He fired the financial advisor. Fired advisor. So taken together, you know, troops are converging on Paris. You have this these, this tennis court oath. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth has fired his advisor. People are going hungry. They're generally going hungry. People in Paris said, you know what? The king is going to try to suppress us again. This is no good. We have to, and especially if he does it with troops, we have to arm ourselves. So they stormed the Bastille. So this right here is a picture of the Bastille. This is the Bastille. And this is a, 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 it's most famous, you know, when you, when you first learned about it, or maybe this is the first time you're learning about it, is, oh, it's a pri they put political prisoners there, and they freed the political prisoners. But in reality, there were only seven prisoners in the Bastille. So it's not like thousands and thousands of political prisoners were being held there and they were freed. The real value of the Bastille to the revolutionaries, we could say, is that there were weapons there. There was a major arms cache there. There were weapons. And so by storming the Bastille and getting the weapons, they all of a sudden could essentially fend off any type of threat that the troops would have. But this was also kind of the very beginning of the real chaos of the French Revolution. And as we're going to see over the next several years, the chaos only gets worse and worse. This is almost, you know, on a lot of levels, a lot worse than the American Revolution because what actually happened in the cities and what fellow Frenchmen started to do each other was really, on many levels, barbaric. And you actually saw it here for the first time, where the governor of the Bastille, the guy who was in charge of it, he had the standoff between the troops 
And he eventually he called for a ceasefire because he's like, oh, there's too much bloodshed. But once the revolutionaries got to him, they stabbed him. They cut his head off, and then they put it on a pike, and then they went back to the mayor of Paris. They shot him. So clearly, things were really uh, getting out of hand. But this is kind of most people associate the storming of the Bastille as kind of the landmark event of the of the of the French Revolution, and even today people celebrate Bastille Day, and that is July fourteenth, seventeen eighty nine. And so just to give you a sense of how quickly all of this happened. The convocation of the Estates General, that was in May. The tennis court oath was in June. And then in July, you have, you have the storming of the Bastille. And then in August, just to kind of complete the idea that we are definitely in a revolutionary period, in August, the National Assembly that, you know, that started off at the tennis courts in the third, third estate, they declared their equivalent of the Declaration of Independence. They declared their declaration declaration of the rights rights of man rights of man and uh, and of the citizen and of the citizen which was essentially their version of the Declaration of Independence, and it's essentially put everything into question of, you know, what what you know what is life, liberty, and pursuit of. I mean, I'm using words from the American Revolution, but this was their Declaration of Independence. It wasn't a constitution; it was just a statement of the things that they think need to govern any type of constitution or country or the ideas that any country should be based on. So I'm going to leave you there. This was kind of we've really now started the French Revolution and now you're going to see that over the next several years it's only going to get bloodier and bloodier and even more complex and when everything is said and done it's actually not going to end that well in terms of giving people liberty.